I'm going to invite my friend, Pastor Sergey, to come and join me on the stage. Uh, Pastor Sergey has become a good friend of mine, and I met him uh, a couple of months ago in Ukraine and fell in love with him and his wife and his ministry and the church. And I thought, man, we got to do what we can to get you here uh, in Woodstock. And, and so what happened for me was uh, I was on a phone call with a friend of mine, Pastor Jerry, who leads a, a great church in Winnipeg. I was on a call with him, and he was just talking. We were talking away, and he just, he says to me, he says, hey, I'm, I'm going to Ukraine in a couple of months, and you should come. And have you ever, have you ever said something without thinking about it? Okay, wives, have your husband ever said something without thinking it through? I had one of those moments. I, I literally just didn't have an answer. I, I just, he said, you should come. And I said, yeah, I would love to come. He's like, great, I'll send you all the details. And I got off the, hung up the phone, and Amber, who shares her office, is right next to mine. She comes in, she says, what did you just say yes to? I said, um, I'm going to Ukraine. She's like, there's a war. I'm like, yeah, I know. She's like, what are you doing? You have kids. I'm like, I know but I'm going to Ukraine. I said yes. And then I went to my parents' house. Now, I'm a, I'm a 47-year-old man. I want to put this in perspective. I went to my parents' house. I said, hey, I just want to let you know I'm going to Ukraine. And they grounded me. <laughs> my dad's like, I don't think this is a wise choice. You're not allowed to go. I'm like, I don't think I live here anymore. Like, I think I have my own house, right? And then he's like, no, you're not going. I'm like, but I am. And so out of that, I went to, the, to Ukraine not having any understanding other than, you know, some stuff I read on the news and I met Pastor Sergey, and I met his family, and I met his church, and I was so touched and so moved, and I thought, man, we gotta do what we can to have Pastor here, and for you as our church to, to hear the heartbeat and catch the vision, and we've given a, a lot over the years to his ministry in Ukraine, and so I wanted him to just bring highlights. So before we do that, let's welcome Pastor Sergey to the house. So awesome, Thank so you, awesome. To start, you know, now, Pastor, you, you are a husband, you, you've got five kids, one adopted, four, two adopted, three biological, um, but can you just take a second and talk to us about your story of salvation? How did you come to know Jesus? What did that look like for you? Greetings to your church. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. Uh, thank you, your wonderful wife and your church for inviting me. It's my third time in Canada. I was in Winnipeg twice. And it's my which first Winnipeg time. is not the best part of Canada. Let's just be <laughs> let's be really clear on that, okay? Like, way better here in Ontario. You can tell Jerry that it's fine. As you told, uh, I married this wonderful wife. Uh, she was born in Ukraine, but she grew up in the United States, so she's American. And when she was 20 years old, I took her from the United States and we back to Ukraine. I have five kids. I have three biological kids and two adopted kids. Uh, to make story shortly, because uh, I am person, I can speak a lot, you know. After service, you can ask me many questions. I can answer you, answer you, and answer you. But, of course, you will not ask, because it will take a long time. Uh, I get saved when I was 19 years old. I grew up in a non-Christian family. When my mom, she was pregnant on nine months, my father, he went to prison. And after three years, uh, when I was three years old, he back from prison. And after two years, when I was five years, he just left family. He found some lover. So uh, my mom, she promises that she will never marry, but she doesn't take care about me because she works in a restaurant to take uh, material support of me. So I grew up, I can say, I was like orphan, without father, without mother, just with my grandmom, she tried to take care about me. So, and when I was 11 years old, uh, the stepfather came to our house, but after four, uh, after four years, when I was 14th or 15th, he killed himself, he did suicide. So I grew up in such bad family condition. I was involved in occultic things. I was involved in bad things in my life. And when I was 14 years old, my father, uh, he went to the United States and he got saved there. And he started messaging me letters and he was newborn Christian. And letters was like this, like, oh, dear son, you are a sinner. You're going to the hell. You will die. You, you get my genetic. You will have a lot of wives. Uh, my father has six five, so, <laughs> by the way. So, life is terrible, life is bad, just go to God. Uh, follow Jesus. And I was, you know, like, I called in Ukraine, I don't know how to say English, like, club, uh, like, nights clubs. My first profession is I'm actor and director. My dream was to go to Hollywood to become a superstar. What Christianity, what church, it's boring maybe. But when I was uh, 19 years old, uh, my cousin, he got saved and his life totally changed. And I understood that God can do something special in my life because 
I grew up, as I told, in a very bad condition family, and I get saved in January 24th, and I'm a Christian now. I'm blessed. On. So awesome. Just want to highlight, you know, his father's aggressive ways uh, of evangelism weren't working, but what did work was the transformation power he saw in his cousin, right? Your life matters, and it makes a difference when you live for Jesus in public spaces. So from that, you get saved, 19 years old, you want to be this big actor, uh, but you get invited to go to a kid's camp. It was uh, July, six months after I, uh, I got saved. So I was invited to go to the kids' camp as an actor. And after my friends, they asked me, like, Sergey, do you want to stay another three days and uh, to be with kids, uh, help with program? I say, yes, no problem. So I stay another three days, and coordinators, they found that I can work with kids. I tried to help them with program. So I was invited next month to go as a leader to the kids' camp. So I went as a leader. Next year, I went as a leader again. And the third year, I was coordinator of this camp. And 2003, I organized my first camp. And in this camp, it was 100 uh, children, 70% uh, of them from non-Christian family. And I remember it was Repentance Day that everybody came to the stage. Uh, they repeat uh, salvation, uh, repentance prayer. So they repent. And after this camp, I start thinking, okay, what we can do with these children? Invite to the church, uh, it's not a good idea. Why not? Good because it was 2003. Now it's kind of better in Ukraine. Before, if you are from Pentecostal or Baptist church, it's kind of sect. It's like different. Now it's, praise God, better. So, and also Sunday school in the school uh, church was not so good. And God put in my heart desire to start an uh, organization for can children. Can I just pause? He mentioned... In Ukraine, where there's a, a lot of Slavic and more traditional, the Pentecostal and the Baptist were, were considered kind of like more extreme or, or, or a sect of Christianity. That's what you were meaning by it wasn't good to, to do that. Carry on. So, and we, uh, and next year we're going to, and uh, after camp was in June, and September we start an uh, organization for teenagers. And the goal was of this organization to take all the children who was in camp, also organize some workshops for them and for the old kids and teenagers for our city. So, and we start workshops like breakdance, hip hop, graffiti, English study, guitar, drums, capoeira, tectonic, you know, like different stuff. And I know that in your church, you have some people from Ukraine and Dima Manatik, he is a very famous singer. He is dancer as well. And he was volunteer in my organization. So we have like English school for 100 kids, uh, students, and also we continue to organize camps. For now, we organize camps uh, like every year, minimum three camps. By the way, right now on the way, my teams are going to mountains area because tomorrow we start uh, camp. It's not big camp, just for 70 kids, but every year we organize each camp like 130 kids. So the first camp starts tomorrow. A second camp going to be in June. Uh, it's daily camp for 130 children. July, you are very welcome and you are invited for the camp in mountains area. Uh, it's third camp in July. And the first camp we want to organize in August in Poland, also one, for 130 children, uh, teenagers. So. so he started in 2003 this wee organization. They start planting camps. Then out of the camps, they decided to run a young adult, or sorry, kids and youth kind of midweek programming and training uh, that's grown to the hundreds and hundreds of kids. Now uh, they, you, they are, they're seeing a lot of kids from families. We want to show you a video of that camp. Маленький потічок в 
впадає в море, і не просив взамін нічого. Якщо любиш, то кохай, що маєш, віддавай. Просто віддавай для себе самого в кайф. Така от простота, просто так, просто так, просто так, просто так, просто так. Правило просте, яблуко росте не для того, на кому росте. Життя. Скільки ще часу хрестить на твоїх грудях, нагадає, в чому суть, нагадає, хто ми є. І що прийняли одне одного такими, як ми є. Земля із блек, кров із ред, минули йде назад, майбутнє тече вперед. Я знаю, що сонце сан, знаю майбутнє сун. І скільки б не було часу, правило просте. Яблуко росте не для того, на кому росте. Маленький потічок впадає в море і не просив взамін нічого. Якщо любиш, то кохай, що маєш, віддавай. Просто віддавай для себе самого в кайф. Така от простота, просто так, просто так, просто так, просто так, просто так. You know, you see the video and you see 100, 100 plus kids, you know, worshiping and having fun and smiling. But one of the things I think is really important to pay attention to is that those kids are all affected by a war that's happening right now, right? So one of the things that, to, that hit me when I was there was how many people um, are touched by this war. Like, yes, you know, the war is happening, but so many people have either a brother or a father or a cousin or an uncle or an aunt, a uh, sister serving in the war. And so when you see these kids, you know, smiling and having fun and being energetic, it's amazing what the church is doing in the middle of such pain. So I want to I want to let you know something. This is my big announcement. I'm super excited. Uh, Pastor Sergey has invited us as Movement Church to come and join them for their week-long camp in July. And so we are going to be leading a missions trip to Ukraine uh, in for that week where we're going to go and we're going to help them run that camp. And we're going to pour out Jesus into 100-plus kids. We're going to invest in their lives. We're going to tell them about God. We're going to let them know there's people in Canada praying for the people in Ukraine. And we're going to do everything we can to have them help fun. If you're interested on that trip, it's going to be an eight- or nine-day trip. And right now the price is looking preliminary around 3200 that could go less if I can find flights for cheaper, okay? So we're still working on all that stuff. If you want to know more about that trip, if you'd like to get more information about that trip, you can text the word Ukraine to the number on the screens, and that will just put you in a queue. When I have some stuff figured out, I will start sending out emails. Uh, but we would need to bring a minimum 10 people. So if you are interested, I would love to connect with you, hear from you, pray about it. Are we going to Ukraine? Yes. Is there a war in Ukraine? Yes. Will you be safe? Probably. <laughs> yes, I no, believe you'll safe. be safe. No, it's safe. It's close to Romania border, so it's cold. Yeah, we're in the far northern side in the mountains. We will be totally fine, and they have plans to get us out. Now, <laughs> Why did you look surprised when I said that? Um, the, uh, so in 2008, I believe it was, you planted these, church, the, the, these camps. Do you feel God calls you to plant a church? Yes. We planted the camp in 2003. I want to add something important because after the camps, we have a lot of fruits. And many leaders now in my staff, it's uh, fruits after the camp. You met Dima uh, Grusha, my youth pastor. He went to our camp because criminal department sent him to our camp. He was home arrest for two years. He was uh, 16 years old. And I remember when he went to the camp and he was a very bad boy. And I remember I came to him. I say, if I will have opportunity, I will just beat you. He's like, no problem. I can beat you back. So 
and he he grew up in an orphanage five children in the family but uh, to make story shortly he became a christian his brother became a christian now he is a missionary in czech republic in our church his mother became a christian his sister now she is missionary in rivna city that we plant church in ukraine and he after the camp, he lives in my house. He is like my son for eight months. And now he is a youth pastor and he is chaplain. He just back morning a few hours ago to lose because he, he is going every second week to the front line and to the red line as we call it. And also uh, I have a bad story. It was like uh, one of the camp. Uh, my daughter, she was in the camp as well. And the group mate uh, shared a story. It was uh, during this war a year ago. Her father called mom and he says, listen, honey, please don't talk. I don't want to tell that women just talk, but you know, so like, don't talk, just listen to me because men like me, we talk more sometimes. So like, don't talk. Do, I, want, I want to tell you something. We are sur sur yes? surrounded. surrounded by enemies and I will not survive. I will die. And she heard some uh, no uh, noises and please take care about children. Uh, he was father of three child. And he says, you're still young and beautiful woman. Please feel comfortable to marriage another man. I will die. And after a few seconds, bomb, you know, like, and he died. So such story, you know, terrible. And that's why two weeks ago, we invite special teachers from Kiev. It's Institute of Heal Soul Healing. And they work how, how to work with children with trauma. And we educate our leaders because, as I told you, tomorrow we start this camp. So to answer your question, uh, I start camp 2003, uh, June, uh, September. We start organization for teenagers for youth. And this organization, we start do not just workshops, activity, with the different places, shelters, orphanages. By the way, when war starts, first week, we evacuate all children from orphanages to take care about them to the Czech Republic. So, and uh, 2008, God spoke to my heart, like, Sergey, I like, I love what you are doing, but my heart is in church. Uh, when I will back again, I will come to take my church. So we have to plant a church. And this time I was thinking, I am not pastor. I like to work with scams, youth, and so on. But we plant the church. And after that, we plant another church in Rivne City. After when war started, we plant church in Czech Republic, in Brno, in Prague. And we plan to plant the church in different cities in the Europe because we have calling for this. So, because God's heart in the church, you know, I just uh, uh, remember the words from the Bible. It's Psalm 27. It's very interesting because today sisters speak about this. Today worship, we think about that God, he is faithful. Today when I wake up in the morning, I feel my heart like from God that I'm faithful. I never late. And it's remind me, you know, verse from the Bible, Psalm 27, when David says that God, he is my light and he is my salvation. What does it mean light? That he provides you. Uh, when dark, you don't know where to go. Today, Pastor Jeff, he tried to show me wonderful place, wonderful buildings that you have. And we went to one room. It was so dark. You know, I was trying to walk uh, careful so don't uh, broke my head. And because it was dark. And he says, God, he is my light. So in this dark <laughs> world, he provides us, he gives life. And the second, what he said, he is my salvation. That the main point in, uh, in verse 4 he says, and I was praying and I was asking for one important thing. And we can say like, what important thing? Like God heal me, God protect me, God bless me. No, he says, I'm praying, I am looking after the main point. I want to be in the house of God, in the presence of God. So I want to encourage you, the best place in the world is church. And that's why we start church. And his heart in the church, his healing in the church. And it's nice that... Many people, many youths coming to the church. I'm so, uh, very encouraged. So God bless you, special youth. You are awesome that you take for seats. God bless you guys. Because future after you. So bless you. The war starts. And, and for you, that was a pretty big day. It was special. It was and special. Big, so explain to tell us, tell us that story. Why special, yeah. yes. Uh, honestly, I'm a very positive person. To be honest, I don't believe that war will be coming. I feel like, no, it's not war, just some stories. But months before war start, I start to understand that it's coming. My wife, she was born in Ukraine, but she grew up in the United States. She gives a birth for my two biological children. I have, as I told you, two adopted. She gives birth in the United States. And she was pregnant. And I says, like, Catherine, 
please uh, go to the United States, take children because war is coming. She says, no, I will not go. I want to stay with my church, with my, uh, like with you. I want to stay in my country. So to make story shortly, uh, 24th, 6 o'clock, she, ah, uh, she planned to have, I forget this word, C-section. The section Excuse planned me. to have in the end of February, and 24th, 6 o'clock a.m. Uh, she wake up and she get message from her mom like Catherine war started. Catherine she wake up me and she says like Sergey, just gather leaders, go to the church. I'm going to the hospital to take special documents. She doesn't want to leave Lutsk, but I says please take children and go to Chernivtsi city. Chernivtsi city is close to Romania border. It's still Ukraine, but it's kind of calm, close to mountains. And she doesn't want to go, but I ask her. And she says, I will go to hospital, take these documents, because next week I will give birth and in this hospital. So to make more sh story shortly, so she went to the hospital, I went to the church, we plan everything, strategy, evacuation women, children, evacuation of orphan children. And she calls me 10.30 and I was so spiritual because she asked me like, Sergey, how are you? Like, I'm good, we make strategy, God will protect us, God will provide us. And she says, you, a spiritual man, just <laughs> come down, coming to hospital, I'm giving birth. I'm like, it's not right time, what are you talking about? No, it's right time. So 24th, when war starts, 11.30, I hold my Lucas son, and Lucas means light. I hold him on my hands. So, thank you. The first night, the first night at 3 o'clock, doctor, he, she came to our room, she wake up us, and she says, alarm, you need to go back to the bunker. We stay five hours in the bunker, it was so cold, and it was not pregnancy hospital, it was hospitals that everybody there, people with different sicknesses. So, uh, we went to the uh, bunker, it was so cold, I was on the jacket. My wife, maybe you will understand, it's a remind her uh, Second World War, because uh, what did women to make child warm? They take away clothes, you know, some physiological things, and hold child. So she makes my son warm, she take away clothes from her, just make war. It's like, you know, like <laughs> uh, 1940, you know, it's not like 21st century. So, and also another lady, it's a very important story, uh, she gave birth the same day, but she doesn't have milk, sorry for such details. And they ask Katya, can you feed another child? It's like Second World War, you know. And she, we was in the bunker. It was so cold. Her bed was broke. It's bunker, you know. I just hold a uh, bed. And as a woman, 80 years old, she was so sick and she feel like she will fall down. My wife like, Sergey, take care about this lady. I tried to take care about this lady. This lady flew out of me. Situation was terrible, you know, like, <laughs> it, it was crazy situation. And what was encouragement for me? My wife, she will lay down after this all stuff, few hours, she preached to all ladies, she encouraged me because they start course everyone. And she says like, guys, let's pray. Let's just take peace from God. Why she did that? Because she's strong? Yes, she is, but not because she's strong. They build Ukrainian women different. That's just very <laughs> okay. giving because birth in bunkers. Because of God. <laughs> yeah. And she receives this peace of God. And it was also what bad because... She got cold and she gets an infection and she was paralyzed for three weeks. Yeah. But still, she lay down on the bed, but she still, first week, she start organize all volunteering work. Because we get contact from our friends from Netherlands, Sweden. We get trucks of food, medicine, clothes. And we get during, uh, for the last two years, over 60 big trucks. So, and she organized everything. Border, it's God. So here she is, she's giving birth in a bomb shelter with all these other sick people around and everything else going through this. And her mindset was, I got to preach to these ladies who are scared and sick and start figuring out how we can make a difference in, in our nation. And it's at that moment I get a phone call from my friend Jerry who's like, um, hey, there's this pastor, his wife's giving birth in a bomb shelter, they want to start doing outreach. I'm like, whoa, slow down, what? Right, and we raised that here to you as a church. And I think we gave about sixteen thousand dollars at that time, at the very beginning of the war, and it went to Sergey's church. We want to show you a video real quick of what they did with that. Just one quick video. I do want to warn if you have kids here, though. We have a great kids ministry because uh, this will have some potentially disturbing images. Let's check out this video.
wife, Chris Chaplin. Боятися страху нічного, ані стріли, що в день пролітає, ані зарази, що в темряві ходить, ані моровиці, що нищить у півні. Ходе тисяча збоку від тебе, і десять тисяч праворуч від тебе. До тебе ж не дійде. Тільки своїми очима подивишся і заплату безбожно побачиш. Бо Господа оборону мою, Всевишнього ти вчинив за своє пристановище. Тебе зло не спіткає, і до наведу твого удар не наблизить. She is really because it was a lie, because they found them and they tried to put like bombs to them, because they killed wonders as well, as she started proclaiming and praying. They, they drive in dangerous. Сьогодні було з утра 10.09.07 прильотів, через пів часа 20. Як вибух самошечі і горить усе огонь, і стікло сипеться на мене, кровать під вікном стає. Тут тобі прилітає та міна, розірвав і рукою ноги собирав. Русський мір нас освободив от всього, що було. Тепер ми поняли, як ми дуже добре жили. Ми тварили ми без світу, без води і без нічого. So very quickly they mobilize uh, being able to become a, a place, a warehouse that starts taking in tons and tons of donations. And they, you said 60 trucks, transfer trucks that they took full of things like blankets, water, fuel, stoves, all of these things they're bringing into these places. And, and as you saw in the video, you know, we don't see a lot in Canada and we're sheltered, um, but they're hitting places of residence. They're, this is where people are living, and now they've lost everything. They've lost water, electricity, and Sergei's church is showing up in the middle of that with real practical things. So when people say, well, church is all about money, listen, it's money that's able to give us opportunity to bless that goes and makes a difference in the middle of Ukraine, and they're showing up into the most desolate of places, providing real practical relief in times of need and preaching Jesus. Preaching Jesus and taking this. Talk about your wife, because you know she gave birth, but now what is she doing? Because it's really She's powerful. chaplain, she worked for the Ministry of Defense. Uh, we just, uh, I just went yesterday from Washington DC. We're visiting prayer breakfast, you know, they have every year. And my, my wife, uh, she represents Ukraine chaplains. She prayed for Ukraine chaplains. And now she worked with the Minister of Defense. She coordinate work, uh, cooperation between international chaplains. And also she is a uh, military interpreter. And we invite different uh, teachers, different doctors who coming to Ukraine. And she helps us. This. And she is going very often to the front line. Uh, by the way, she was invited to visit your church with me. We booked the flight tickets, but sorry, she need to go uh, with the team, with the legation to Ukraine back because Wednesday she is going back to the front line. It's very necessary this time to do that. 
so she works with this and also she continue try to find help for ukraine you know like uh, just shortly it was a few months ago she get a uh, desire to find laroposcopy uh, system to make surgery because in ukraine till now if you want to do surgery they just cut you know like your stomach but uh, laroposcopy Lap yeah oh, okay. larop yeah scopic and she contact our friend from netherlands and we get the system it cost like forty thousand dollars we get for free we bring to hospital and now hospital open doors for us because we bring something for them and now every week our volunteers uh, going and preach there you know if you for example you will ask me like sergey but what you're doing more during the war we do everything but we're looking for example war start uh, evacuation war start refugees coming to my city because we live close to polish border it's kind of cold we also get some rockets so we try to help them after a visit east of ukraine camps winter is coming we need medicine let's bring medicine winter is coming we need stoves so try to do the best but the main point plan the churches because uh, we take now Kherson area and the minimum what we want to do there to plan the church you know and what is encouragement i just want to tell you important thing uh, i know story from uh, one church they are very close to the front line and this church was like 800 people and when war uh, start many people like uh, run from this city and church ah, it's Nikolai sorry it's not front line it's dangerous but not so much and many people left uh, run from Nikolai city and church become like just 150 people but newborn Christians start with the church from front line as a refugees and now this church for the last two years 2,000 people so salvation is coming to country so it's encouragement for us it's encouragement and do you know I think the last point after one year when war start I asked my wife it was last November Catherine you're doing a lot please just go to United States our friends they want to pay our flight tickets take children rest and she says why Sergey I was praying many years for this uh, uh, the when people uh, get saved revival revival thank you for this revival and now you want to just kick out me from country no what i can do just lay down in california and take selfie video no right now uh, we went to washington and one pastor from seattle asked katya oh uh, are you going to sacramento visit your relatives katya no why spend extra money for flight uh, for flight tickets I better take this money and uh, buy tourniquets. I just came to Washington DC. I was invited for the special purpose and now I'm going back to Ukraine. No time for the rest. So it's not because we are nice people. No, because it's neat. God's calling and God bless us in this. So. It's amazing. It's wild to think that a boy from a house where mom is working all the time and dad left, stepdad commits suicide, he's now being used to change their entire nation. It's amazing to think that, you know, his wife gives birth to a baby in a bomb shelter. I can't even wrap my head around that. Yeah, she's praying for people and now she's leading the national chaplaincy movement in the army and, and this you know i i had the amazing privilege of going i got to see the orphanage i got to go into prisons i got to go um, to the war veterans hospital and you and i when we think of veterans we think of our canadian or, or maybe even american mindset of people who are like our career military and chose that at some point i'm sitting in the hospital and i'm talking to somebody and he's lost his leg and he's telling me his story and he's like i'm a baker i worked at a hotel i was a baker and the war broke out and i got enlisted to serve and he says in two weeks training i went from being a baker to being a medic for the army and he went in and he rescued i think it was like 50 or 60 people he's accredited for for rescuing but he's literally rescued somebody and driving in his ambulance doing work on a person and a missile hits the ambulance and kills the driver and takes his leg this is just a baker i met another guy who was just a normal person working in a normal field and he's showing me a video uh, of these missiles and he's sitting in a bunker with ready to fight and they're they're bombarding him the air and he's literally showing me videos of missiles just flying over his head and he's like i'm just a software engineer and now today i've been holding a gun and a one of the missiles landed by him and he got hit by the shrapnel 
And Sergei's church is in there every week preaching to these guys and these women, telling them, hey, you still matter. You still have purpose. You still have value. You're still important. They're sitting on the front lines through his wife and the chaplaincy talking to these men and women, reminding them as you fight today, today may be your last day, God loves you and God has you. Kids are growing up with the chaos of all of this sitting at the very forefront. Yet they're holding on to Jesus. And the people that have left Ukraine have created the opportunity that Sergei has now planted churches in all these other nations where people are gathering from his church that have left and they're planting churches and reaching other Ukrainians, other people in places like Czech Republic and these other spots. It's amazing what God can do. So I got to close because we're out of time. But here's, here's, here's two things that hit me when I was on the trip. It, it was amazing. One of them was a conversation I was having. I forget the guy's name, but he, he worked in the army and he's now in leadership at their church. And he said, he said, Pastor, you know, um, we're at war physically with, with another nation. He says, and we're losing our young people on a physical battleground and they're dying. He said, but from what we're paying attention to in the news, you in North America are at war as well, and you're losing your young people. You're losing the sexuality and gender philosophies and all of this stuff. He's like, our people at least know what they're fighting. Remind your people what they're fighting. And it made me realize that, man, sometimes we've just been a little too comfortable, right? There is a spiritual war. A war is not against flesh and blood. It's not against people or even people groups or identity groups. It's against principalities in this dark world. And we got to fight for our kids spiritually. We don't do that by attacking groups. We do that by praying. We do that by loving. We do that by creating spaces where these students are able to grow and our kids, Ellie and the kids, can grow in their understanding of who God is. The other thing that hit me was this. I had an amazing experience. I taught at universities. I was been in bomb shelters like four or five times that week, you know, trying to teach and we're teaching in a shelter or we're with students trying to, uh, at this orphanage, sharing our testimonies and we're doing it in shelters. But the most impactful moment that I had actually was on my first weekend we were there. We had just gotten into Ukraine, gone to bed, woke up the next morning. I'm going to Sergei's church and I'm being driven and the air sirens went off. And I've never heard air sirens before other than through movies. And I'm like, Pastor, what is that? He's like, well, those are the air signs. Like, what does that mean? He's like, well, missiles are coming into our country right now. I'm like, oh, uh, okay. And he's like, well, we're, we're supposed to shelter. Uh, we're supposed to what is it, stay, take, stay place and shelter. We're supposed to go to bomb shelters right now. But we're going to church. I'm like, oh, okay. We're going to go to church while they're sending missiles to Ukraine. This is awesome. I... I'm going to get grounded again, right? Like, and I'm thinking, I'm going to go to church, and like nobody's going to be there because I'm from Canada. And Canada, if it's sunny, we don't go to church because it's a beautiful day. If it's raining, we don't go to church because we don't want to get wet. If it's snowing, we don't go to church. If it's too cold, we don't want to warm up the car. And, and so like literally our attendance patterns will be affected by the simplicity of weather. So if it's between minus five and plus five and semi-cloudy, we'll get a good crowd. But also of that, it becomes, as ah, like, who's going to be at church in the middle of an air raid sign where legally they're supposed to be going to bomb shelters? And the place was packed. And they were worshiping Jesus. And they were crying out to God. Because they knew their salvation and their safety didn't come from a bomb shelter. It came from being in the house of the Lord, in the presence of God, where they leaned into him and they worshiped him. They knew that, that nothing could protect them or save them. There was no structure. They lost people already. And they knew that where they needed to be was in the house of the Lord with Jesus. And it hit me. I'm too complacent. I'm too easy. God, if you're good to me, if you answer these things, if you do this, if you're, if you're nice to me, then yeah, my worship will be great. But if it's a little bit difficult, a little bit inconvenient, ah, we'll see. We'll see. Some of us allowed spectator Christianity. Some of us have allowed the idea that church is just a routine I'm in, and this is what I do. 
And I sat with people on that Sunday morning in a, it, well, actually it was in an art gallery because that's where you were meeting. And in an art gallery, worshiping God with bombs coming in the air, possibly, potentially death could happen with people who have lost people in war saying, I am worshiping God because he is all I have. He's all I have. He's all I can. I need him. I will worship him. As for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. Let's stand all across this place. A couple of things I want to highlight before I dismiss you is this, is one, I believe in this room this morning, there might be some of you who might be saying, hey, you know what? Hearing these messages makes me realize that I need to do more for God. Maybe you have a call of God on your life. Maybe that's to go on the mission field. Maybe that's to go into full-time ministry. Maybe that's to make a lot of money and fund ministry. But you have a calling on your life. And I want to encourage you, don't ignore it. Don't let complacency and safety and ease and pressure to fit into culture to be the thing that drives you. But I want to encourage you instead, would you be obedient to your calling? Because look what happens with just a young man from a broken past that says yes to Jesus many years later is being used to speak at the White House about Ukraine. Like it's mind-blowing to think what could take place and what God could do in, in and through a person who says yes to Jesus. Secondly, I want to just highlight, let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Have you been complacent? Is Jesus your everything, or has he just been a good sidekick? Have you allowed him to be Lord of your life that says, it's the most defining thing is who I am, is Jesus. It's the most important thing to who I am, it's Jesus. In the identity culture wars, my identity isn't in my sexuality, it's in Jesus. I am a Christ follower, a man or woman born of the Holy Spirit. I am touched and saved and sanctified. And the scripture says, I am a royal priesthood. I am a child of God. I am a special possession, is what it says in 2 Peter. But that scripture carries on to say, I am that so that I can proclaim the praises of God. I was created to proclaim Jesus. So maybe we need to deal with some complacency in our own lives today. Whereas God, no, no, I want to be who you call me to be. So maybe you have a calling. Maybe you let complacency slip in. And it's time to say, no, 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 I want to be on fire for God. I want to go deep than just the motions. I want to live for Jesus. So, Father God, I pray for everybody in this room and everybody watching online. I pray and I ask in your mighty name, Lord Jesus, that you would move. God, if you're calling people into the mission field, let them respond with yes. If you're calling people into full-time ministry, let them respond with yes. If you're calling people to have businesses and careers, let them respond with yes. If you're calling people to lead small groups, let them respond with yes. If you're calling them to step into volunteer roles and ministry positions, let them respond with yes. Lord God, may you, God, just call people. Secondly, God, I pray for those of us that have allowed uh, complacency to enter into our lives. God, I pray in your mighty name that we will not let that win. Instead, today, we renew ourselves to you. God, we declare to you, God, you are our everything. You are our number one. We submit our lives to you, Lord Jesus, and we want you to be center. Set us on fire, Lord. Set us on fire to live lives fully surrendered to you, empowered by you, so that those around us would see and hear the good news. They would see the light of the gospel of Jesus instead of the darkness of the world we live in today. God, set us on fire. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. And I'd like to pray for Ukraine before we do. Would you do me a favor? Would you just reach your hands forward and, and reach over as my friend and my brother? Father God, I pray for the, the nation of Ukraine. God, I pray and I ask that you would just protect that nation. God, we ask that you would end the war in the name of Jesus, that this war would end and Russia would be uh, moved back and back into place. God, I pray for the safety of the nation of Ukraine. God, specifically, I pray for those that are in the war-torn parts of the country, that in the middle of all this darkness, that God, they would continue to hear your gospel being preached and they would choose you. God, as people scatter from this country, I pray that they would plant churches 
churches and the gospel would advance in the name of Jesus and cities would be changed because of your outpouring, God, and by you moving people to these different countries and these different cities. Holy Spirit, I pray for Pastor Sager and his wife, God, and their kids, Lord Jesus. I pray that your hand of protection to be upon them. God, you would watch over God as, as his wife is at the front lines. Protect her. Watch over her body, God. Watch over her mind and her health. God, their kids as this both husband and wife serve so diligently, are so busy doing the work of you. God, protect their kids. Watch over their kids. Empower their kids to live for you in a deep way. And God, I pray that you would use their church, God, to make a real difference. Continue to pour out your blessing upon them. Continue to use them. God, continue to bring faithful partners around them that would finance the work that you're doing through their ministry. And Father God, I pray as we send a team there, I pray, God, that you would make the finances possible for them. And I pray that, God, you would open up doors for that. And I pray for your protection to be upon it. God, touch the amazing nation of Ukraine. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can we give God a big, huge round of applause? As your pastor, I want to bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to bless you that you would be a royal priesthood. I want to bless you that you would walk under the anointing and the fullness of who God is. I want to bless you that you would live for God fully and not just take it for granted. And I want to bless you that you would experience everything that God has in store for you. And I bless you that as you leave this place today, you don't leave the presence of God. You don't leave the anointing. Instead, you carry it with you everywhere you go. So go in the power and the might and the anointing of Jesus. God bless you. Have a great day, and we'll see you next Sunday.